Hello, good to see you. Pastor Sam with a devotion from Jeremiah 39 through 41. We're going to be kind of covering three chapters, doing a little bit of um, jumping around in these chapters. Because there's, there's uh, we'll, we'll kind of summarize the action. I'm, I'm getting anxious to uh, start a new book and I want to finish the book of Jeremiah. So we're going to we're going to move a little bit more quickly in this last half of the book. And what we're kind of looking at is God has really set everything that he's going to be doing um, early in the book. And we've been looking at that in a little bit more depth. And now it actually happens. And so we're going to be kind of looking at the major pieces of action that happen in these chapters and probably doing some um, a little bit more jumping around as we get closer to the end of the book, maybe pausing if there's a section where, where something kind of truly new comes up. A lot of this is things that we've heard and talked about before now finally happening. So I don't especially want to uh, just say things that I've said before. I'd like to kind of, we'll summarize today, but we're going to look at quite a few things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what we're going to do since I am kind of jumping around, I'm going to look at, and I've got my notes down here. That's what I'm looking at. We're going to read, we'll read some of the headings because the headings kind of help us. And then we'll read the little sections that I have and kind of talk about it and, and go from there. So Jerusalem is going to fall, finally. I do want to point out uh, just the time here because I always like to look at the time. So the ninth year, in the tenth month, uh, the siege started. Ninth year, tenth month. Then, in the eleventh year, fourth month, a breach was made. So for a year and a half, the city of Jerusalem was under siege, and that would be common back then. Um, you would just basically wait for the city to starve, is, was kind of how uh, war was made against well-fortified cities. So they waited a year and a half. Eventually, the people ate everything that they had in the city, and then they lost. Right, But uh, verses 9 and 10, we're going to look at. Then Nebu Zaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Nebu Zaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. So what we're going to, the, the kind of overarching thought today is that the people who are left don't know what to do. Now, there's people who get carried into exile, and that's the majority of the people, and they're sort of okay in exile. They at least have somewhere safe to be. They don't really have to worry. But there's this minority of people who are left, and, and here it says the poorest, the poorest of the people got to stay behind, and they sort of inherited everything, which sounds sort of nice, but we're going to see they don't really know what to do or where to go, and there's a lot of just um, upheaval and turmoil happening. And we're going to end this devotion, at least, with the thought, hey, let's go to Egypt. So kind of some, um, and this is one of those good thing, bad things happening. That's kind of what I want to point out. So the whole city got uh, besieged. The city got more or less destroyed. And some of these poor people get, you know, vineyards and fields. So that, I mean, that sounds like kind of a good thing, right? Before the war, you had nothing. After the war, wow, you have lots of vineyards and fields. But um, there's just a lot of turmoil going on. So they're not able to use and enjoy this gift that they've had. But the Lord will be delivering Jeremiah. So uh, verses 11 and 12. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, these names, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So we've got this sort of special exception for our man Jeremiah, where the king specifically looks out for him. 
And regardless of the sort of uh, geopolitical forces at play, we're going to see, right, I mean, the section well states it. The Lord is delivering Jeremiah. God is specifically looking out for his prophet, wants to keep Jeremiah there. And we're going to see that in a little bit. Jeremiah gets the decision on where he wants to go. God is going to keep Jeremiah in and around Jerusalem so that God can keep uh, instructing and really encouraging the people who are there. Although things don't go that great, people kind of tend to ruin the things that God has. But Jeremiah gets <clears throat> sort of called out specifically at this point. And Nebuchadnezzar is like, hey, make sure he's okay. Do whatever he says. Right? Jeremiah gets well taken care of. Okay, and then, like I just said, God sends a message through Jeremiah, so 15 through 18. I don't know if I can make that all. No, not quite. Be on screen at the same time. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian. Now, if you don't remember him, he's the one when Jeremiah got thrown into the cistern, into the pit, Abed-Melech came to the king and was like, you just did something bad, Jeremiah is going to die. And so Abed-Melech got Jeremiah out of the cistern, and now he's getting, I don't want to say repaid for that, he's getting shown some special recognition for that. Go and say to Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. So again, we have God's words. Um, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm, and not for good. And these kind of stand in stark contrast to the people who got carried away into exile, right? Because if we think back God's letter to the people in exile, um, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil. So again, it's this sort of um, counterintuitive logic, plan, where the people who get exiled, the sort of losers, right, have good, God, God plans this good for them. But the people who stay behind and inherit all of the stuff, the maybe lucky people who don't go as like prisoners of war, uh, are going to have bad happen for them. God has plans even for more worseness <laughs> against the city of Jerusalem. And it's always important for us to notice what God is doing, right? God wanted the people to be carried off into exile. So the people who follow his plan are going to be well taken care of. Even though something quote unquote bad is happening to them, God has this ultimate plan to, re to return them to Jerusalem and to kind of re-secure them as his people. So all the people who follow along are going to be protected and taken care of. The people who get left behind, who seem like maybe the more fortunate ones, are, are really just in store for more badness. And that's kind of what we're looking at today and what we'll look at a little bit more next time as we sort of jump around for these things. But Abed-Melech is going to escape you shall have your life as a prize because you put your trust in me. Right? You were looking out for uh, my prophet, God says. And so I will, I will reward you by allowing you to live and to escape, which will not be the fate for the majority of uh, the other people. Okay, I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Jeremiah remains in Judah. There we go. So he's going to get this decision. And I think we're going to kind of read some of that. 
Okay. Verses 11 and 12. Likewise, when all the Judeans who were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and in other lands heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and had appointed Gedaliah the son of Ahakam, son of Shaphan, as governor over them, then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah. And they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance. Okay, and what I wanted to focus on here we seem to have this sort of gathering action. And, and, it, and it kind of anticipates the gathering that God has promised, but the problem is the people are sort of doing it on their own. And these were people who had previously deserted the land of Judah and had gone off on their own and who were not following God's plan because God's plan was you're going to be taken into exile in Babylon. I'm going to watch over you and protect you in Babylon. And then I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. And so these folks here are kind of trying to skirt God's plan. They, they thought that they had taken care of themselves. They had like escaped from the war. And now they seem to be coming back. And there's this remnant and it actually uses the word remnant, which really caught my attention. Um, because God had been using the word remnant before. And, and this is a, a recurring word, especially throughout the uh, Old Testament, although Paul does use it in Romans. He talks about a remnant chosen by grace. And, and the overarching idea is that when God punishes especially his people, when God punishes, he doesn't punish to the extreme. He always leaves a remnant. So look at uh, like Noah and the flood, right? God punishes all the earth, but he keeps Noah and Noah's family and the animals with him alive. There's this remnant chosen. Or um, we can look at like the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years God keeps this remnant alive. A lot of the people die as they wander in the wilderness, but there's this remnant that gets to go into the promised land. The idea of a remnant. And Jesus even talks about this. He doesn't use the word remnant, but when he talks about uh, like the, the parable of the sower, right? God's word is, is scattered as the seed, and yet really only a quarter of the seed ends up being fruitful, that's that kind of remnant idea. That of all the people who hear the gospel, there's really just this kind of minority that takes it to heart and that trusts and that is ultimately saved. Right? That's that remnant idea at play. But now here is a remnant that exists by virtue of the people and not by virtue of God. And we're going to see that that creates some problems. Okay, so uh, since I skipped over it, this guy Gedaliah gets appointed governor by King Nebuchadnezzar. And um, somebody here, some this guy named Ishmael is going to take his life and will eventually kill him. There we go. Gedaliah murdered. That's the one we're coming to next. Okay. Uh, yeah, we are going to focus on that. In the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Netaniah, son of Elishama, of the royal family, one of the chief officers of the king, came with ten men to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mizpah. And they ate bread together there at Mizpah. Ishmael, the son of Netaniah, and the ten men with him, rose up and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword and killed him whom the king of Babylon had appointed governor in the land. Ishmael also struck down all the Judeans who were with Gedaliah at Mizpah and the Chaldean soldiers who happened to be there. So we have this apparent prosperity and peace, right? Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroys the city. He sends a lot of people into exile. He leaves a remnant in Jerusalem who seem to have sort of escaped the worst of, worst of the disaster. But this dude Ishmael comes and kills the sort of acting governor and 
uh, a bunch of the Judean people who were with the acting governor, as well as the um, soldiers who are there. And so we're just, we're seeing some turmoil being created and uh, the, the people not really knowing what to do. So this is going to come to a head because they want to go to Egypt. So the end of 41 verses 17 and 18. They went and stayed at Geruth Kimham near Bethlehem, intending to go to Egypt because of the Chaldeans. For they were afraid of them because Ishmael the son of Netaniah had struck down Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. There's this, there's this recurring thought that Egypt provides salvation for the people. And we saw it much earlier in the book of Jeremiah where the king wanted to have a treaty, a, like a kind of a peace treaty and a, a protection treaty with Egypt that Egypt would protect Judah from specifically uh, Babylon. And God was like, hey, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. If we look back to uh, the book of Isaiah, King Ahaz wanted to, I'm pretty sure this is right, wanted to form a treaty with Egypt against Israel, I'm talking about the northern ten kingdoms, Israel and Syria, I want to say, a little bit fuzzy on that one. But, but the idea is that uh, Judah and Jerusalem looked to Egypt to provide safety and salvation, and God is like, don't have anything to do with Egypt. Ever since the people came up out of Egypt, the Exodus, the plagues and the Exodus, and the crossing of the Red Sea, all that stuff, ever since they came up out of Egypt, God basically says, don't look back. Egypt is bad news. I don't want you going back to them. Egypt is not your salvation. Egypt was your captor, and I freed you from Egypt, and now you're going to have nothing to do with Egypt, except in the next chapter, uh, they're going to want to go to Egypt. And so next time we're going to kind of look at Jeremiah warns them against it. Surprise, the people don't really listen. So a lot of action happening in these uh, three chapters that we've covered fairly quickly. This is probably one of the more brief devotions. But a lot of this has been set up. A lot of this, God normally does this kind of pattern where he begins with um, a warning. Hey, if you keep doing this, here's what I'm going to do. And he gives them these chances to kind of turn things around. And based on how the people do, and normally they do okay. They don't do great. They don't do terribly. Normally they do okay. This time they did horribly. And God was like, okay, you remember that warning? Now I'm going to make it happen. And so he gives them sort of a final warning. And then eventually the stuff happens. And so now we're at the point where a lot of this stuff is happening and, and a little bit more chronologically. Jeremiah is not really laid out entirely chronologically. But, but sort of here on out, we are in a fairly chronological thing. Jerusalem falls, uh, the people get this appointed governor, uh, and it doesn't work out, so now they're going to want to go to Egypt. And we're really hearing about the remnant that, that formed of itself in Judah and Jerusalem. And we're not going to hear so much about the exiles in Babylon because God kind of prepped all that in the beginning of the book. If you go to Babylon, things are going to be okay, relatively speaking, as opposed to the people who stay here and things go kind of from bad to worse for them. So that's kind of it. Just a lot of action. Not really anything too terribly new or insightful, but this, this what we've looked at is the playing out of everything that God had warned the people. So anyway, cool. A little bit shorter devotion. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, you give us plenty of warning 
about your thoughts and your intentions. And we ask that you would help us to hear your word. You would help us to realize and to change our lives in the ways in which we break your word. Help us to remain faithful to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so again, we're going to be kind of marching through the book of Jeremiah. I think I'm going to do the next devotion right now. So I kind of keep my thoughts all together. But you, come back next time. God's peace be with you. Until then.